This is my copy of William James's Principles of Psychology, published in 1890. If you look through the table of contents, you'll see there's a wide variety of things covered in this book. We have the functions of the brain, on some general conditions of brain activity, habit, the automaton theory, the mind stuff theory, the methods and snares of psychology, the relations of minds to other things, the stream of thought, conception, we have perception of reality, reasoning, the production of movement, instinct, emotions, will, hypnotism. It's nearly 1400 pages long and its scope is massive. Many psychology textbooks were published before the principles, but this book was very different from those. Here, James tried to explain how physiologically the human mind works and it had a monumental impact on the growing field of psychology. In fact, for several decades after, it was rare for a psychology student anywhere in the world not to have read some part of the principles in their education. And here's the amazing thing. This epic book took 12 years for William James to write. Have you ever done something that took 12 years to finish? Can you even remember where you were 12 years ago? Every great creation has an untold story behind it. A saga, perseverance, passion, and personal struggle. Today, I delve deep into one such tale that shaped the history of human understanding. Welcome to my channel where I explore some of the intriguing anecdotes hidden behind the most influential research in psychology and neuroscience. I'm Eric Vanman, a psychologist at the University of Queensland. In today's video, I chronicle the incredible journey of William James and the creation of his groundbreaking work, The Principles of Psychology. In a previous video, which you can find here, I briefly introduced William James and why he's so important to psychology. Born in 1842, James hailed from a wealthy and intellectually stimulating family with four boys and one girl. Expectations were high and the stage was set for greatness. Indeed, his younger brother, Henry James, became one of the leading novelists of his time, writing such classics as The Portrait of a Lady, The Wings of the Dove, and The Ambassadors. Their father was determined that his children have a world-class education. So he took the family to Europe on grand tours and to attend schools in England, France, and Switzerland. James and his siblings learned to speak English, French, German, and Italian fluently, and they all felt thoroughly at home anywhere in Europe. Yet, from an early age, William found himself trapped in the clutches of anxiety, depression, and fragile health, painting a stark contrast to the brilliance that surrounded him. His path to understanding wasn't a straight line. It was a winding road that took him from art school, where he painted watercolors and learned to draw, to studies of biology, which included some time that he spent accompanying the famous Louis Agassiz, a Harvard biologist, geologist, and paleontologist, on an eight-month expedition to the Amazon. And finally, James went to medical school because his father thought it would be a sensible profession. James grappled with bouts of existential crisis throughout this journey, amplified by physical illness and indecision. James was a knowledge seeker, yearning for a profound connection with the world around him, but he felt shackled by his limitations. He interrupted his medical studies from 1867 to 1868 to read Darwin, travel to Europe, and visit the laboratories of Fechner, Helmholtz, Wundt, and Dubois Raymond. He ended up finally receiving his MD in 1869, but never practiced medicine. His personal struggle reached a fever pitch when James considered ending his life at 28. The weight of his thoughts became too much and he stood on the precipice of oblivion. But at this darkest hour, the course of his life took an unexpected turn. He decided to accept the view of the French philosopher Charles Renovoix that we have free will since we can sustain a thought because we choose to when we might have other thoughts instead. James decided his first act of free will would be to believe in free will. He also resolved that he would take the mind seriously for the rest of his life. Harvard hired him in 1872 as an instructor in physiology and anatomy in the Department of Medicine. By 1874, he was offering a course on the relationship between physiology and psychology. How did he learn about psychology? Well, some of it came from his own experiences, but he also observed the behaviors of others around him, and he read all that he could from those in Europe that were conducting research. 
James once joked that the first lecture in psychology he ever heard was the first lecture he gave to his students. With renewed vigor, he threw himself into exploring the human mind. He embraced psychology as a drowning man would a lifeline. It wasn't an easy journey. His health deteriorated and his personal demons haunted him, but the spark of passion kept him going. Through grit and determination, he began to claw his way out of the abyss. In 1878, he made two major commitments. First, he married Alice Howe Gibbons. And two, he signed a contract with the publisher, Henry Holt, to write a textbook on psychology. After a decade of painstaking research and intense study, he started working on his masterpiece, The Principles of Psychology, and he told his publisher he hoped to have it finished in two years. The task turned out to be gargantuan. It took him over 12 arduous years to complete. During those long years, many major life events occurred. He and his wife had four children, one of whom died of whooping cough at 18 months. Both his parents died within a year of each other, and so did one of his younger brothers a year later. Every word he penned was a battle won, every chapter a testament to his resilience. The book became a mirror reflecting his inner journey, his struggles and his victories. He struggled with some of the chapters for many months. His vision failed him often, and sometimes his wife helped him by taking his dictation. He constantly suffered from back pain and sat out remedies for insomnia. Much of the book was handwritten, but sometime in the 1880s, he started using one of the first typewriters, even though it could only type in uppercase characters. Some chapters were published early as articles in scholarly journals. Some chapters were based on notes from his lectures at the university or to a public audience. During this time, he also started offering courses in psychology in the Department of Philosophy. He eventually ended up moving to that department for good, and there he established Harvard's Psychological Laboratory, one of the first in the United States, which was further developed in the 1890s when Hugo Munsterberg joined the department. James liked data, and he made sure his book focused on the latest empirical research. James himself conducted research on dizziness by spinning his participants around in a chair many times. And he looked into hypnosis. He personally hypnotized dozens of students to measure their perceptions, and he devoted a chapter to hypnosis in the principles. He was also very interested in parapsychology, particularly in the way psychics and seances worked. He spent thousands of hours observing famous psychics, seeking scientific explanations for their supposed mystical skills. Apparently, only one of those psychics ever truly stumped James, such that he could not come up with explanations about how she knew about events in his own life that he didn't know about yet. In 1889, even though he was probably not even two-thirds of the way done with his book, James decided to build a house to accommodate his growing family. So he worked with an architect and dithered about every detail of his new home. They ended up moving in in December, and that's where James finished his book in the next year. That house on Irving Street in Cambridge, Massachusetts is still there. I happened to visit it in October 2022. It's just a few blocks from where the William James building that houses the Department of Psychology stands now. Finally, in May 1890, after innumerable drafts and countless sleepless nights, the 1,700-page manuscript was sent to Henry Holt. He wrote to Holt, No one could be more disgusted than I at the sight of the book. No subject is worth being treated of in 1,000 pages. Had I 10 years more, I could rewrite it in 500, but as it stands, it, it is this or nothing, a loathsome, distended, tumefied, bloated, dropsical mass, testifying to nothing but two facts. First, that there is no such thing as a science of psychology, and second, that W.J. is an incapable. Yours, provided you hurry up things, William James. It wasn't merely a book, it was a revolution a work that seamlessly intertwined philosophy and science to delve into the mysteries of the human mind. James's journey wasn't without hardships, but he transformed his struggles into a beacon of mankind. His exploration of the human mind, inspired by his personal battles, revealed the complexity of human consciousness and pioneered a whole new realm of psychological understanding. James gave us the concept of a stream of consciousness, the idea of self, and delved into the mysteries of habits, will, and attention. He helped us understand ourselves better, providing insights into the very fabric of our thoughts and emotions. 
The story of William James is one of triumph over adversity, a tale of how personal trials can lead to profound insights and everlasting contributions. His magnum opus, The Principles of Psychology, remains a cornerstone in the field, reminding us of the extraordinary journey of its creator. James once said, the greatest use of life is to spend it for something that outlasts it. Indeed, his work has outlasted him, influencing generations of thinkers and reshaping how we perceive ourselves. And his story, his inspiring journey, is a beacon of light for all of us, reminding us that even in the midst of our darkest battles, we can create something truly timeless. If you enjoyed this journey into the life and work of William James, don't forget to subscribe and click the bell icon for more enlightening tales. Until next time, keep exploring, learning, and remembering. Every great work has a story. Find yours and stay curious.